I've been ringing the bells for over a whole year now. I've been ringing the bells for just over six months. I am novice Jonathan Blaze. I'm novice Tony Wolnikowski. And this is our podcast, Echoes from the Bell Tower. Stories of wit and wisdom from Benedictine monks who live, work, and pray in southern Indiana. Benedictine monks are Catholic men who live in community and are devoted to seeking God and doing his will by following the rule of St. Benedict. We introduced ourselves as novices, which is someone who's starting out in this way of life. In our community, you're a novice for one year. This year means that we're going to learn more about the community, learn more about the rule of St. Benedict, and we're also going to discern if this is God's will for us. And after that first year as a novice, then we make our first vows of obedience, stability, and faithfulness to the monastic way of life. In this episode, we'll be talking about the bells of St. Meinrad. And what a great topic for our first episode, because the bells and the bell towers are one of the first things people notice when they come to St. Meinrad. No matter which direction you drive into town from, you can see the bell towers over the trees, and they leave a lasting impression. They're sort of iconic of the place, a symbol. They're even in our logo, so we thought, what a great way to start out. It really isn't a great way. The bell towers kind of lead people into St. Meinrad, and the bells call us to prayer. We're going to hear stories from other monks that explain what the bells mean to us. The rule says that the signal for the monks to come together to pray the divine office uh, is the responsibility of the abbot, or, it says in the rule, he may delegate that to another monk. This is Arch Abbot Justin, who leads our community here at St. Meinrad. I've been uh, put in the monastery since 1973, and like every monk, I started out as a novice, and so that was my introduction to the bells of St. Meinrad, up close and personal. In our house, the bells have been traditionally the call to prayer, and when I came to the monastery in the 70s, it was the standard practice for the novices as part of their duties to be ringing the bells. It's one of the many, many symbols in our life that carry a weight beyond just the actual thing itself. And so for us, the little quip used to be that the bell is the voice of God that calls us to prayer. So those novices are doing us a service, but they also are participating in yet another ritual that is part of the monastic life. And by that ritual participation, it ties them to the community's life as a whole. Novice Tony and I have recently learned the ropes, pun intended, of ringing the bells. And so here are some of our thoughts. My biggest anxiety was always, am I going to make the bells sound okay? <laughs> because <laughs> you can get like a good rhythm or you can have a horrible rhythm. Yeah, some people have no rhythm at all. And, and so you just have noise. <laughs> the, the goal is you never really want two bells to sound at exactly the same time. We call that clanging. So you want them to always be alternating. And uh, So while the bells won't clang against each other, the noise like will bounce like sound is one and it just isn't as pretty. So you kind of want like this like ding dong, ding dong. Yeah, like. the philosophy is that the, the bells are really a musical instrument and so you're trying to perform them in a way. Yeah. And um, when they're all going, it's, it's not really possible. It's just kind of big cacophony. When you're just ringing one or two by yourself, it's easier because you kind of get the motion. Like you get like, I mean, it feels like you're milking this giant cow. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Like, yeah. like, like, <laughs> One other thing that strikes me about the bells. This is Father Christian. He's been a monk here at St. Meinrad for 10 years. Is the function that they play or the role that they play in your formation when you're a novice? Because it's, it's a big part of your life at that time when you're early on in the community and that you're, you're in charge of this. And it's something St. Meinrad's well, well known for these bells. And as a novice, you feel like oh gosh, I'm, I'm in charge of something that's, that's kind of important. But they really teach you a lot because there are six bells and you can't ring them all. When you're in charge, you have to go out and find people to help you. 
And so they're really a lesson in learning to depend on the other monks. I will tell you a little story. One time, and I don't remember, it's been a long time ago, one of the guests said to me, are those bells automatic? And I said, yes, they are. Whenever it's time to come to prayer, the novices automatically run in the bell tower and start ringing the bells. I think that a hands-on experience, there's simply no substitute for it. And it is, again, I think, a ritual way that we can participate in the life. And so for the novices to do that, or for any of us to do that, I think it is a way that um, we involve not just our minds, but also our hands and our bodies in our prayer. Every monk has stories from when they rang the bells. And as is only natural, because monks are humans too, these stories include mishaps. Times when bell ringing didn't go very smoothly. Like in 1985, when a prank was pulled on Father David Rabenecker. Father Jeremy relives the tale for us. Well, this was in the time we still had our college, and college students loved to play pranks. And David had just graduated from the college, and he had some friends over there still uh, that uh, possibly could have tried to get even with him for some little trick that he had made and played on them. And so David went in and he began to ring, pull the rope for the bells, and the rope would move and he could feel the bell moving, but there was absolutely no sound coming out of the bell. So he tried other bells and no bell in the south tower would ring. Everything was uh, silent. So he goes out into the church and Father Alaric was there and Father Alaric said, well, why don't you go over and use the bells in the other tower? Well, the only bell that he could really use over there was the death bell. So at 5.30 in the morning, the monks were awakened by the death bell, the bell we only ring by itself when a monk has died. I could not even imagine being woken up by the death bell. So afterwards, the challenge was to figure out what was going on. Brother Luke Huddy was the business manager and responsible for the physical facilities. Uh, and so they climbed the tower and found that the bells had been stuffed. The hammer of the bell had been covered in each bell by cushions and multiple layers of duct tape. It was from that day forward that the bell towers are locked. But to this day, no one knows who did it. While we leave you with that unsolved mystery, let's listen to Brother James's bell mishap when he was ringing bells with Brother Pedro. Brother Pedro and I were in the bell tower for Vespers 1 and for, I think it was Mass. So at Vespers 1, Brother Pedro said, you know, there's a bunch of, uh, like, rope dust coming down as you're ringing, like is on my habit. And he said, you know, that, uh, that usually doesn't happen. And I said, oh, it's probably fine. I just kept ringing. And then the next day, we noticed it again. The rope was kind of frayed and it, as we were ringing. And so I'm pulling the rope, and all of a sudden, it gets really light. And I look up, and I don't know what's going on, and Brother Peter said, the rope broke. So instead of getting out of the way, I look straight up, and I watch the rope come hit me in the face. And then I ducked, and the rope like fell all on my back. And then we go to the Stazio line to get ready, and my whole back is covered in rope dust. So people are, like, helping clean me off as we're starting to Stazio in. And Stazio is when the monks process into church in the order of seniority. I couldn't see it, but I, I was like, uh, well, no other option. But the funniest part of the story is instead of getting out of the way, I look straight up to watch it come down. Some of us monks, including myself, have fears of ringing the bells at the wrong time. Here's Father Christian again to tell us a story. One time when I was a novice, I rang them all at, at the very wrong time. So they were supposed to ring at, say, 7.25, and I, I rang them all at 7.05 in the morning. And, you know, as a novice, you're worried about doing everything right, and uh, I did it at that time. And, of course, one of the other monks runs into the bell tower and says, what are you doing? And... Uh, I was very embarrassed, but 
you know, when you first enter, you think everything is perfect and nobody ever messes up, and if and you're the only one who could who could mess up. And of course, messing up the bells was something that it's not just one person's going to notice. Everybody knew that you had rang the bells way too early, and so it was catastrophic in my mind. But uh, most people were able to just laugh about it, and so that actually made me feel better and felt like, oh, this is a place I can kind of make a mistake and and be all right afterwards. Uh, so turned out to be a good experience. Arch Abbott Justin tells us a story of when Bell 6, our largest bell, was replaced in 1997 because it was cracked. Prior to 1997, even as a novice, for me, that bell was already out of commission. For several years, we kept striking the hour with it. It became sort of a joke because when it would ring the quarters, they were very crystal clear. When it would strike the hour, they would call it the cosmic garbage can because it sounded so empty when it would hit. The crack made such a difference. In 1997, when we were getting ready to put it in place, the company that was charged with putting the bell in the tower had measured and they took out the set of louvers that is at the very top of the tower and the little pillar in between them. So there was a clear space, which looked tight. And several of the monks said, that bell won't fit through there. And they said, oh yes, yes, it will. We've measured it, it'll fit. They put it on the crane, hoisted it up, and it did not fit. They had to lower the bell, take out some of the stonework so that the bell could be tilted and the lip of the bell could then fit through where the stonework had been removed and then put in. So it is a true illustration of the old maxim, measure twice, cut once. Some monks have had the experience, uh, what we like to call flipping the bell. We are going to bet that you don't know what flipping the bell even means. It's not like flipping pancakes. There's no delicious treat at the end. There sure isn't. <laughs> no, but Brother James and Brother William are going to give you an idea of what flipping the bell is like. I never had a panic attack before I came to the monastery until I went up into the bell tower because I'm extremely afraid of heights. That was really scary. It was Pope Francis had just been elected. It was on the day of his election, and we found out that there was a new pope and so our tradition is to ring all six bells in both towers. So typically you have one person ringing bells one and two, and you have one person ringing bells three and four. But because everybody was all excited, we had one person on bell one, one person on bell two, one person on bell three, one person on bell four. So the person ringing bell one had too much strength, and at the end of the ringing, he pulled it too hard, and the bell flipped over. Okay, so now this is kind of hard to explain because the bell rope itself is on this big wheel that is um, adjacent to the bell itself. Now this wheel kind of acts like a pulley. So the, the rope goes over this pulley and that's what you're actually pulling on is this big wheel that turns the, the bell. Well, if you pull it too hard, the entire bell can flip over kind of like a, you know, a kid in a swing flipping over the, the top bar. So it renders the bell useless. The rope is not over the wheel anymore. And so you have to actually go up into the bell tower and flip the bell back over. That is, swing it with your hands. And this is a two-person job. Uh, Brother James and I were novices at the time. Now, Brother William is extremely afraid of heights. Going up in the bell tower is, is funny to me because it's so, um, it's so, like, janky. It's just real rickety and old, and uh, you're going up this thing wondering if you're going to, if you're going to get back down. Um, but you, you climb up these, this spiral staircase that goes up 100 feet into the air, and you get to this room where the big rose windows are, and it's just, it's, there's this trap door that you open, uh, kind of like a cellar door, and you crawl out onto this room that's about uh, 20 by 20 
maybe 20 feet by 20 feet by maybe 30 feet high. It's a really high ceiling in that room. And in that room, it's just open sandstone and there are these rungs, these iron bars just, just bolted into the sandstone that go all the way up to the next floor. So there's no stairs, there's just these bars that go up, uh, you know, like monkey bars, jungle gym type thing. Um, but they're right in the sandstone. And so you crawl up these things and there's another trap door up there that's just about as big to, f and to fit yourself. You go through this thing and you get up there and that's where the bell platform is. And it's on this like paper thin sheet metal that you have to stand on. Um, you know, it's 100 feet in the air Depending on the time of year, it's cold and it's gross. But you get up there, you climb through this trap door, you have to step over the hole you just crawled out of. Um, I was terrified to go up through this trap door and get onto the bell platform. It was a cold day, it was March, it was windy, really windy and kind of wet up there. We were so excited, we both got up to, all the way up to the high top of the bell tower, and then Brother William looks at me and he looks down and he says, uh-oh, and he was so scared. He went into the corner of the top of the bell tower and just stood there. Brother James got up there fine. I got up there and just immediately freaked out, just completely seized up. And I was yelling at Brother James, oh, I'm freaking out, I'm freaking out. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to need your help trying to flip, flip this bell back over. And we took both of our strengths to get the bell flipped back over, trying to talk Brother William into helping flip the bell uh, and overcome his fears was a little bit difficult. Um, we got the bell flipped and he had to crawl down the ladder that got us up there. And he kept saying the whole time, he's like, I can't do this, I can't do this. I don't know how I did it, but I guess it was pure adrenaline. I, I managed to get myself back through the trap door, down the iron rungs, back down to the platform. And in like a split second, he like had a surge of energy and he jumps on the ladder and climbs all the way down and he's down to the bottom, like the base of the bell tower within like a minute. He just went. And we get to the bottom and we realize that we flipped it the wrong way. So we had to go back up uh, and flip it back the right way. But this time he stayed a level down because he didn't want to go all the way up. So I had to flip the bell twice by myself because I had to flip it once to get it back to where it was and then another time to get it back on track. But it all worked out. But it, it was quite a comical experience getting to the bottom of the bell tower after Brother William's fears and realizing we, well, probably me, flipped it the wrong way. The sound of the bells accompany the monks through their whole monastic lives. They define our time as novices, they daily call us to prayer, and ultimately they call us to our final home when we leave this life. Appropriately, in our last segment, we'll learn about the role the bells play at the end of a monk's life. I really like the bell ringing for funerals. This is novice Timothy Herman. We ring what's called the death toll bell, and that's bell five. So all six bells have really long ropes, but bell five has two ropes. There's one that's like for typically to be pulled if we have a big feast. It's the long rope that we pull, but then there's the death toll rope that you just pull it once and it, the, the hammer and the bell strikes the bell once. So ringing for funerals is interesting. When we learn that a monk dies, we ring the death toll bell for as many years as he's been professed a monk. So we recently had Brother Benedict who died and he was professed for 76 years. So we pulled the death toll 76 times and it's every 15 seconds. So it ended up being you know, a little more than 20 minutes worth of ringing. And so it's interesting to hear that bell because you don't hear it like that very often and it's symbolic of, of a monk dying and you associate it with a monk dying and, and the good things and the graces that come from that. 
And then again, we, we kind of do a similar thing at the at the funeral liturgy as we're processing um, to the graveyard from the church. Um, you toll the bell again, and then once the casket gets and the procession gets to the to the cemetery, then we start the full peel again for another three minutes, and it kind of kind of echoes the death toll. Um, it can be really an emotional thing. It's it's a very kind of lonesome sound when it's just that one bell. Mm-hmm tolling and then it just gives you a sense of how long he was here because it, it takes you know, I, I'm going to do the math but it takes minutes and minutes <laughs> um, that that one bell is sounding and then to have such a um, it's such a joyful sound yeah. when you, when all six are going at once and it's like oh he's well, it's our prayer that he's that, that kind of echoing what's happening in heaven We ring bell five at this really critical moment. Uh, so we ring bell five when you're making solemn vows and when you're lying down uh, on the floor of the Abbey Church and you know you, you, your face is, is on the floor and you're hearing the people praying around you and you're making vows and consecrating yourself uh, to God for, and for the service of the church. And so it's a really big moment, and during that moment, you know, the novices are, are ringing bell five. And it's really a sign that you're transitioning into a new uh, reality in your life, a, a new commitment, a new meaning and significance for, for your life. And then we ring that bell again when people die. And so it, it kind of links those two moments of transition and gives them a, a sacredness. I, I think the bells, in that sense, they they remind us of the unity of our life and are a sign of, of those sacred moments. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy learning a little bit more about St. Minerid. This podcast was produced and edited by Krista Hall and music by Novice Jonathan. We want to give a special thanks to Archabbot Justin Duval, Father Christian Rapp, Father Jeremy King, Brother Zachary Wilberding, Brother James Jensen, Brother William Sprower, Novice Timothy Herman, Mary Jean Schumacher, Tammy Sheeter, Jim Paquette, and Christian Mosek. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast, and tune in next time to hear about St. Meinrad, the man, the martyr, the place. If you want to learn a little bit more about our life here at St. Meinrad, check out our blog at stminerad.edu slash echoes. When a bell is first installed, it gets christened or baptized, we call it, and at that moment it's given a new name. Um, well, it's kind of like us. Yeah. We're going to get new names at the end of Novitiate, so we're kind of, that later episode. Um, we're kind of like bells. Yeah, we are bells. <laughs> Ding dong. <laughs> um,